Hi, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Richard Reed. I represent the uh, Rhode Island chapter of the American Cochlear Implant Alliance. And the Alliance is about 10 years old now, and it's made up of doctors and teachers and audiologists, speech language pathologists, uh, parents, and of course, uh, people like me, implant users. Maybe you can see that. I'll show it to you a little closer later. Um, we're a nonprofit organization created to eliminate barriers to cochlear implantation. When I got mine in 2002, uh, there was a lot of misinformation around about the process. And actually, I was probably eligible five years earlier and was uh, so anxious and scared about it that I put it off. Uh, I'd been a musician all my life. I started playing in nightclubs when I was about 12 years old with my brother who was 13. Um, my parents, uh, you probably think they were crazy, but they were just so proud that we could actually uh, start making money playing music that they let us do it. They'd drop us off at gigs and pick us up at one in the morning in the summertime. Um, I lost my hearing, ironically, I guess, to an antibiotic called gentamicin. So it wasn't the loud music. It was, uh, I'll give you a second to spell that. I got it. Uh, it was an antibiotic. And I started out with a moderate hearing loss, which felt severe until it progressed to a severe profound hearing loss. And I realized how lucky I'd been with just the moderate one. I used hearing aids and they just didn't do much for me. They were better than nothing, certainly, but it was a different world. I used to try to go sit in with my friends and, uh, and play. You know, I'd know what a G sounded like in the key of E. I'd know that that made that an E minor chord. And I was just pretending to be my old self. And uh, one night, a chord came out of the keyboard and I was playing along and nothing was coming out. Uh, complete silence on my part. And I remember my friends looking over at me uh, with pity, which is the worst part of the whole hearing loss experience for me was uh, trying to avoid people's pity. And so I started researching getting a cochlear implant. And again, there was a lot of misinformation, uh, a lot of mythology back then. And I had wished that there was one spot that I could go to on the internet that would give me uh, the facts and advocacy and um, solid facts and research. And uh, that's what the American Cochlear Implant Alliance tries to do for people. Um, one example, of their work currently is they pushed strong for a bill that was just passed that uh, got payments for telemedicine for audiologists and speech pathologists during our current COVID-19 um, crisis, um, which is why I'm talking to you online instead of in person. But we'll get there eventually. Um, I'll share the uh, Alliance website with you. Um, you can slide the slide in sometime during this presentation. The website answers a lot of CI questions. Um, let's see here. I'm just going to pause while I... A cochlear implant. I mean, most of you probably know by now what it is but it's not a culture killer. It's not uh, anything like that heavy. It's just a tool. In that way, it's a lot like a hearing aid in that it has a microphone, actually two little microphones. Maybe you can see those little black dots uh, and a processor and something a hearing aid doesn't have, uh, this transmitter. And that transmits the signal across the skin to a receiver that's just underneath my skin. You know, I was thinking it was gonna be like brain surgery. They're gonna drill into my head. 
it's not it's not that it's not brain surgery uh, in fact it's outpatient surgery now and uh as anxious as i was to get mine a couple of weeks later i met a woman who was 92 when she got hers and she went out to dinner at a restaurant after the operation which uh which made me feel like a baby um back to the american cochlear implant uh, alliance website there's a woman named Nama Tizek, and Nama's blog has a lot of information um, that's structured just to help people in a day-to-day -day, um, usage or getting used to the idea uh, of an implant. And she had a, a nice one about the COVID-19 experience. And one of the things that she said in her most recent blog about that was, uh, to reinforce being independent and strong, to feel like you're in control. It's really important, especially now. And it reminded me of how uh, weak I felt when I was uh, deaf, because uh, I'd walk into a grocery store and I knew that uh, any question that someone asked me was gonna be problematic. So uh, the other day I was in a grocery store wearing my mask and the cashier was wearing her mask and she was behind plexiglass. So even with my powerful microphone and my ability to turn it up with this little adapter here, um, there was problems communicating. So the first thing I said to her was, I'm hard of hearing, but if we go slow, I'll do okay. And then I said, uh, you can't tell, but I'm smiling behind this mask. And that kind of lightened the mood and uh, it kind of lifted the anxiety out of the situation. And uh, she went slow. She didn't have to ask me anything. I guess she said credit or debit. But, uh, you know, I'm, I was anticipating that question. And uh, we just had the usual pleasantries, even though I was having a hard time. Uh, but it got, it was so hard in the beginning, really hard, uh, just walking into a situation and telling people I have hearing loss. And if I say I'm hard of hearing, they don't always know what to do, but they'll work with you. Most people are kind. And the, the ones that aren't, you can usually get away from. Okay, back to the Alliance. Another, uh, another post from Nama's blog is about maintaining a routine, which is a real key, um, especially while we're stuck at home. I know things are about to open up again here in Rhode Island, thankfully, but until they do and until things are back to normal, um, maintaining a routine is key. Um, because there's enough uncertainty in your life with different sounds and um, having to do things online instead of face-to-face, -face, um, using technology instead of real relationships. Um, we'll get used to it. It's, uh, it's still a process for me, but staying oriented with what's going on around you, it's key. Uh, a lot of people with implants are tempted to just take them off, especially if they're living alone. Um, they'll put them in a drawer during this thing. It's really important that you leave it on and uh, listen to your environment and know what's going on. Uh, it's easy enough to text and not have to use any sounds, but uh, there's also things on the website telling people who deal with people with CIs, uh, how best to talk to them on the phone. It's, uh, it's one of those things that uh, we should practice. And the ACIA uh, has a lot of support for rehab where it didn't used to be that way. It used to be you get your hearing aids or your cochlear implant or maybe one of each 
and uh, they turn them on and say, well, we'll see you in a few months. And now there's a lot more concentration on getting you up to speed, um, especially kids. But uh, don't take my word for it. Check out the website. Um, I'll, I'll insert a slide here with the uh, address along with um, my own email address, which you can always call me or um, send me an email or text me. Let's see. Uh, I mentioned how scared I was about getting an implant. Um, one of the things that let me move forward was when my niece, Grace, uh, turned about two and a half years old, she started to acquire language and started to be able to speak a million sentences. And before that, when she'd been just a baby, I had a really great thing going on with her. I could just make a funny face and get a laugh. And uh, as she started to be able to speak and I couldn't hear, there was a wall between us. And it was, it was really kind of breaking my heart. And that's when I decided, okay, I'll get this thing and hopefully be able to hear her a little. And when I scheduled my appointment, it was for October 7th, 2002. And I knew it was a familiar date and I mentioned it to her, Gracie's mom. And she said, that, that's Gracie's birthday. So I said, oh, I'll, I'll switch it. I'll, I'll get another date. And she said, no, it's a, it's a good omen. And uh, well, I've been able to sing happy birthday to her every year since. And now she's uh, just completed her sophomore year at Brown online and has a 4.0, for which I take no credit. Um, but she calls me up after her last exam and uh, we're really uh, connected again in a way that I don't think we would have been had I not got this thing um, on my head. So there's one story with a happy ending. Um, since getting my implant, and being able to play music again, which is, is rare. Music is hard for people with cochlear implants because the frequencies of speech are so much narrower than the frequencies of music. So the fact that I really worked hard at it um, for about two years and was finally able to start playing again um, meant that researchers wanted to uh, talk to me and test me. So um, I've been all over the world sitting in audiology booths when I get there, um, but also talking to crowds um, in England and China and Belgium, uh, all over the United States. It's really funny to me that uh, as far and wide as I played uh, music all over Canada, all over North America. It was uh, going deaf and getting my hearing back that brought me all over the world. Um, it's one of those things that I, I wouldn't have expected it. I couldn't have planned on it. Uh, before I got my implant, I was just hoping to be able to, to talk to my pals again and, and my niece and maybe uh, find a girlfriend. Who knows? Um, and that happened too. We're together still for 15 years now. Um, so again, it's just been one happy ending after another to me. Um, the thing about COVID-19 recently is I really think in some poignant ways, it, it gives people with normal hearing a little taste of what it's like to be hard of hearing because everybody's wearing masks and you don't realize, I think, especially older adults like me, uh, how much speech reading you actually do from day to day with strangers, with noise in the background. And you take away uh, the vision of the, the visual of someone's mouth 
behind a mask and it's hard and it's exhausting it's draining to have a hearing loss and have to concentrate on what someone's saying with your eyes and people are getting that now uh, and just as we're appreciating you know the person in the grocery store and uh, the cop on the beat a little more than we had uh, i think people are appreciating the challenge of how hard it is to communicate the day-to-day -day stuff i mean we'll find out if something big happens uh, we're going to see that on tv or be all over the internet but it's missing the little things it's missing the hey how are you or hearing somebody say you know uh hope you're having a good day having someone check in on you um those are the things i think that are psychologically uh, a lot more of a loss when you don't have them uh, a lot sadder than missing you know whatever the big thing is on tv or in the news um we'll catch up on that but it's hard to catch up on lost conversations and the ACIA, the American Cochlear Implant Alliance, tries to get people connected. And um, if you'd like to get in touch with me, any questions you might have about the cochlear implant process, and it is a process, it's not just a, a surgery and turn it on and, and go. It's a months long process, but uh, can be a really positive one if uh, you're prepared. So feel free to get in touch with me. And I really appreciate the opportunity uh, of the commission asking me to do this today. Hope everybody's uh, safe and well during this strange time.